Seeing as we're so close to Rosh Hashanah, it needless to say makes sense for us to learn about Rosh Hashanah. And I'd like to do something which might take a, a day or two, but just to develop an appreciation for Rosh Hashanah that might be a little different <clears throat> to what we normally think and what we normally know. So you ask the average person, I'll tell you Rosh Hashanah, it's a very special time, it's family time, people have large Rosh Hashanah gatherings, although this year it's advisable not to have a large Rosh Hashanah gathering, rather keep it small, because we could take all the precautions at shul to keep everybody safe, and then everybody's going to go out for dinner and expose themselves, which wouldn't be so smart. And it's of course a very spiritual day. It's a day that we spend extra time davening, it's a day that we're a little bit more pensive, so it's definitely got a, a spiritual um, aura to it, regardless of what, whether a person knows or doesn't know what Rosh Hashanah is all about. But if you really want to understand the real nature of what makes Rosh Hashanah so unique and special, what we need to do is we need to go right back to the beginning of time. Because when we daven on Rosh Hashanah, when we daven Musaf, one of the things that we say is, Ze hayoim t'chilas ma'asecho zikoren le'yoim rishon. This is the date of the beginning of your making. In other words, that Hashem made creation. And Zikaron today is a commemoration, it's a remembrance of Yom Rishon of the first day. So one of the overwhelming themes of Rosh Hashanah is the theme of creation. This is the anniversary of creation. So if we want to understand what Rosh Hashanah is, logically we need to go back and understand how creation works. Because whatever creation is, whatever the platform and the technique that Hashem used in order to create was, that somehow <clears throat> going to play a role in Rosh Hashanah every single year. So how did Hashem create the world? That's where we should begin our conversation. Not when, that's a different conversation. But how did Hashem create the world? That is extremely relevant for understanding Rosh Hashanah. So you go back and you have a look in the beginning of the Torah. And you'll notice that the theme is that Hashem spoke. And Hashem said, let there be light, and there was light. And Hashem said, let us make man, and they made man. In other words, every concept, every major milestone of creation, of which there are ten, is introduced with the expression, and Hashem said. Now that's really important for us, because that's going to share information not only about the creative process, but specifically about the nature of Rosh Hashanah. What is the nature of Rosh Hashanah? Rosh Hashanah is a time that commemorates when Hashem created the world specifically through words. So we have to ask ourselves this. <clears throat> Hashem is capable of anything. He illustrates that by the fact that He could create such a complex, vast universe. And that is in addition to the spiritual universes in just six days. So that tells you you can do anything. Why does he choose to create the world through speaking? Why didn't he, for example, snap his fingers and then there was a world? Or why didn't he just think and then there was a world? Now we know that everything in Torah is very specific and it's supposed to be indicative and illustrative of how the process works. So the fact that Hashem spoke in order to create is very significant. If you want to understand how creation works, we need to understand the process of speaking. Now, Hashem was very nice to us. And what He did is He designed us in such a way that we could look at ourselves and understand things about how we operate. And those would give us very useful clues as to how Hashem operates. So we look at ourselves and we say, how does speaking work with me? If I understand the technology of human speech, it will give me an insight into the technology of divine speech. A human being operates primarily in three ways. Thought, speech, and action. Now action, if you have to do something, that usually indicates that you have to exert a fair amount of energy. It, it takes effort to do something. For example, if, if you were to construct something. So Hashem creates the world. If we were to create something, whatever it is. Let's say you were to make a sculpture. Let's say you want to do do a, a feature in your garden. Let's say you wanted to renovate part of your house. Let's say you wanted to come up with a computer program. Anything that a human being has to do in action requires exertion. And exertion means that I invest myself in it. That's why when it's over, I feel tired. 
Okay, sure, I worked hard today. If you think, well, there it depends. I know that some people over here will tell you to think is even more exertion. It's more difficult than to, to do. But the truth of the matter is that that's not true because the mind is constantly thinking and it's an effortless process. It's an effort to make it meaningful thinking. But your mind is always thinking. The expression is machshavam moshoitetes tomid. The mind is always working. It doesn't necessarily mean that thought is always deep and meaningful. But thought is always. Constantly, your mind's thinking. Even if you drive the car, it's subconscious, but your mind is thinking. Turn the wheel, change the gears, apply the brakes. So thought is probably the least effort requiring part of the three. And speech is somewhere in between. It doesn't take a huge amount of effort in order to speak. Some people find it easier than others. Um, we're not judging over here the nature of what you say, but the actual process of speaking is relatively easy. You open your mouth, you say the words, the words come out. It's not particularly difficult. So action is the part of us that requires the most effort out of the three. And thought requires the least effort except there's something else that's interesting about thought. Thought is the deepest of the three. So action is completely removed from me. You know, something that I do at the end of the day, it, it could be that I don't even think about doing it. For example, you could walk down the street and as you're walking, your action is that your foot kicks a pebble that's lying in the street. You didn't even intend to do it. That's how divorced action could be from yourself. Whereas thought... Thought is what it actually becomes you. You know, the things that you think start to define you and they start to define your reality. So speech, on the one hand, doesn't have the exertion of action. So that means I don't invest myself in the process to the same extent as if I did an exerting action. On the other hand, speech is more superficial than thoughts. I could say something and after say, I never said that. Whereas if I think something, it's now part of me. It's kind of embedded inside of me. The reason that Hashem chose to create the world using speech is for these reasons. Number one, Hashem wanted it to be clear for us that in order for Him to create, it did not require exertion. It's not complicated for Hashem to, to create. From our vantage point as humans on earth, we look out at the world and we say, Wow! Whoever made this must be absolutely brilliant! That's because from our perspective, it would have taken an incredible amount of exertion and an incredible amount of precision to get this to be what it is. From Hashem's point of view, He says it's not action. I didn't have to work hard in order to do this. It was as much effort and energy as it is for you to say 10 sentences. That's why the creation happens in 10 sentences, because that's all it took from Hashem's part. The equivalent energy of 10 sentences. Zehu, that's it. So on the one hand, it's telling us how great Hashem is because His creation is so little, so to speak, of His investment. On the one hand. And on the other hand, what it's telling us is and how much, in, not only how much exertion did Hashem have to put in to create the world, but how much Hashem did Hashem have to put in in order to create the world. See, the thing is this. When I speak, if you think about it, and it doesn't matter what I'm saying. At the end of the day, how much of me am I sharing when I speak? Think of it this way. For every sentence that you say, there are literally a hundred thousand other sentences you could have said. So that means that when you speak, although what you're doing is sharing, simultaneously what you're doing is filtering a whole lot of alternatives of what you could have shared. So if you take the one sentence that you're speaking and you compare it to all the other potential sentences you might have spoken, it's actually quite small or quite insignificant. Now, if you take that sentence and the various permutations you might have used to say it, and then you compare it to all the things that you have said in your whole life, and it'd be interesting to know how much a person says in the course of a lifetime. If you take this sentence and compare it to all the things that you've said in your whole life, you're going to see that it's, it's minuscule. And then if you compare that to all the things that you could have said in your whole life, because remember, each sentence has thousands of different possibilities. 
And then you realize that everything that you could have said or everything that you do say is insignificant compared to how much you think because you think many more thoughts than the words that you say. So if I'm a human being who has the capacity for all of these thoughts, how much of me do you get to know from the one sentence that I've shared? Nothing. That's why Hashem creates the world specifically using the technology of speech so that we should appreciate it was no effort on his part, number one. Number two, the amount of himself, the amount of revelation, the amount of God that was invested in the process of creation is minuscule compared to what he could have done, all the different thoughts he may have had about the possibilities of what he could have done, which of course in turn is nothing compared to him himself. If you had to collate all of my thoughts and put them all together, you wouldn't get me. I'm not the sum of the parts of my thoughts. So that's what we need to know. When we talk about the process of creation, it's an incredibly powerful process for us, yet for the speaker, for Hashem, it's actually a very superficial process. So anytime that we try and define God and say God is great because he's a creator, we're actually missing the point. God is way beyond the creator. What impresses us is the fact that he's a creator. So that's our first introduction to the notion of Rosh Hashanah, the concept of Rosh Hashanah, this idea of Hashem speaking in order to create and how that indicates the very minimal effort and investment that Hashem needed in order to create and how much more Hashem there is completely beyond what creation might offer us. That's step one of understanding Rosh Hashanah.